Hi, everyone. If you're just joining us, feel free to take a look at our poll. Just want to take a quick temperature check of the group just to get a sense of what folks are hoping to learn today. So the response is overwhelming, K through 12. See what their expectations are for today's market. Okay, one more and then we'll we'll get started. Sharmila, okay to get started? Sure, I'm good. Okay. All right, all right. Well, hi everyone again. Thank you for joining today's session, how to launch your educational therapy career with our instructor, Dr. Sharmila Roy. My name is Carrie Williams. I'm the communications and information officer here at Extension. I'm gonna be helping out with our chat. Just a few um, quick fun facts about us before we get started. We are the professional education branch of UC Santa Cruz. Our campus is based here in Silicon Valley in Santa Clara. You can see some of our neighbors over there. Um, we have six areas of study. Pre-med is the newest, which launched last year. We're very excited about that. We offer over 300 courses, which can be taken individually or packaged towards certification, specialization series. Um, many of our certificates are F-1 visa compliant and may be supported by workforce programs. We are an accredited University of California institution, and we do offer a sort of pay-as-you-go, course-by-course pay structure, which we hope helps to provide a, a more affordable learning option for students. Um, and of course, we believe our biggest asset is our rock star of our roster of experienced, uh, insightful instructors who provide generously provide their insights, experience, and support to our students every day. And one of those instructors is with us today. So let me take a quick look at the agenda just to give a sense of what to expect, um, and then we'll jump in. I'm going to wrap intros and housekeeping in just a second. Then I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Roy, who will give you a brief overview of our program and then bring in our panelists for our discussion. Uh, we're planning about 30, 35 minutes um, for discussion and panel, and then um, we're saving about 10 minutes for Q&A. We do have a lot we're excited to cover, um, so we're going to ask that we save questions until the very end, but you can go ahead and add those questions as they pop up into the Q&A box, and we'll just work through them as soon as we wrap up our conversation. Um, I'll hop on at the very end um, to share a couple courses that we think will help build out today's conversation a bit more. So with that, let me bring in Dr. Roy. Dr. Sharmila Roy is an educational therapist. She is an instructor and chair here with UC Santa, UCSC Silicon Valley Extension. Uh, she works in private practice here in the Bay Area. You can see she has a long list of teaching credentials. We feel very fortunate to have her with us today. Um, Sharmila, I'm going to stop my share, and the floor is officially yours. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a privilege to be here with this panel and have uh, the support of UCSC with the uh, Educational Therapy Program. Um, I am really looking forward to the panel discussion, particularly um, right after uh, I tell you a little bit more about uh, our program. So I can tell you pretty confidently that our educational therapy program at the extension is the best educational therapy certificate program at an extension campus. Uh, there are lots of them out there. There are universities. We are a professional program that seeks as soon as you graduate, you kind of get to um, start a practice or get a job. That's the goal. <clears throat> Having said that, let me start my share and introduce uh, today's panelists include instructors in the program who are highly successful, experienced, and um, getting the students ready for what they need to succeed in the field. Uh, we we'll start with Erin, Erin Burke. She uh, teaches the two assessment classes that are vital to educational therapy, and they are in the core list of programs that need to be uh, courses that need to be completed. She is in private practice and uh, focuses on educational assessment. <clears throat> Her experience includes being director of educational services at Morrissey Compton. And uh, for me, uh, the biggest hook is that she's an advocate with youth in the juvenile justice system. 
uh, that is speaks volumes to her uh, commitment and her work for those who are less fortunate. <clears throat> Next is Shelley Haven. Um, she, Rachel Haven, um, we tend, she tends to go by Shelley. And uh, she teaches also a very important course right now because uh, assistive technology for education has become uh, mandatory almost. I mean, how can you survive without it? So she is currently, uh, she's highly experienced and she's a assistive technology consultant in private practice and it, she's given her, her website there. She's certified assistive technology professional and ATP. She's a rehabilitation engineering technologist technologist, R-E-T, and she has experience uh, with directing the uh, assistive technology uh, program at Stanford University in the Accessible Education Program. <clears throat> Our students, Rachel Roth is a current student and she has 20 years of experience in the field of education. And 10 of those, she's worked with neurodiverse youth and young adults in a variety of settings. She has a master's degree in special education, and she has a graduate certificate in transition to adulthood. Rachel has almost finished her program. She's currently finishing her capstone project, the practicum, and then she will be a certified ed therapist. Jessica Chuang uh, is a uh, very esteemed alumna, and she has 13 years of experience running her own centers. Currently, she owns Keone Learning and Assessment in the Bay Area. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and education. She's got the Ed Therapy Certificate from UCSC Extension, and she's currently enrolled in a master's program with an emphasis on special education. So I'm really looking forward to listening to these folks and their wisdom about the field. All of us, in some way or other, deal with learner variants, neurodiversity. And these include only some of uh, the diagnosed students who come to us or seek evaluations. And we help them with academic strategies, with tech, and with great evaluations that point out their strengths and areas where they could uh, do with some more support. <clears throat> So our graduates are not tutors. We get that question a lot. How are you different from a tutor? Because we provide customized academic support uh, for those who are struggling uh, with learning problems. We help, we look below the surface and we try to find what are the underlying processing issues that are impacting this person's academic performance. We develop those missing skills. Um, importantly, we do individualized evaluations and a wide range of remediation and interventions uh, that help a student to overcome all kinds of um, challenges and obstacles and succeed not only at school, but also um, out there in real life. So we delve much deeper than a tutor who will stick to the curriculum. We actually do much more than homework help. Our graduates work either in independent practice privately, or they join a learning center, um, as an educational therapist, learning specialist, Kaiser is now employing educational therapists. And here are some other places in the Valley 
that employ them as well. What is our secret sauce? Sauces are put there because I think we have several. The emphasis is on application. We do the theory, we follow the textbook, we are an AET approved program, but the emphasis is on getting you prepared to start practicing soon after you graduate. I think that we are very affordable and uh, definitely much more affordable than private universities that offer this program. Uh, the instructors are practitioners in the Valley, in Silicon Valley, very successful. And they offer you practical, actionable strategies and resources. Uh, our online registration is a boon. So you start whenever, and hopefully within 1.5 to two years, uh, you're done. We are definitely an equity and social justice embedded focused program where across the curriculum and all of our courses, we stress the fact that um, inclusion and equity are important. Um, and we are open to students who come from different backgrounds because we have a set of courses that they can take and move on to the core courses before um, graduating. It's a 30 unit program and no master's degree required. You need a bachelor's degree. If it is in education or special education or you're a resource teacher, great, but it's not necessary. And the sequence of four courses you can finish in about a year and a half. And then you have a capstone, which takes about six months. And I'm really happy to see that it is growing. You were right. Because post pandemic, there's been a lot of upheaval with online education. Um, teenagers, more and more teenagers that I work with coming in with toxic stress. Um, they are self-diagnosing because of course there's TikTok and Instagram. Um, but they are, I'm very impressed by the self-awareness and what they need. So I think the field is growing and it's also an accessibility uh, issue that uh, we are trying to provide services for everyone. <clears throat> What's new in the field? Definitely AI. Shelly, I know you're going to answer this question later, but uh, she makes a, dis a distinction between generative AI and AI because we've all been using AI, she says, for a very long time, but more on that later. Uh, definitely a higher number of students requiring uh, academic support, uh, technology support, and the social emotional piece has become uh, front and center piece now. So uh, we have to kind of be prepared to have students who will come in and uh, we'll have many behavior, uh, we present uh, many behaviors that we need to be aware of. Uh, I've already talked about self-awareness, uh, what kinds of jobs, there are about 5,000 jobs, your um, salary range, if it's part-time, you, you, know, you could earn more, uh, a lot more. And, um, those are the rates, uh, the New York City rates are higher than Silicon Valley rates right now. That's amazing. And that, those are the rates in Manhattan. And uh, you could be in private practice. What kinds of skills do you need? I don't know what you think, but definitely if you're coming from a different job market, I would say the top skill you would definitely need is management, time management and organization skills. Be very flexible and to persevere with an individual even when you're not getting through for some time and to keep encouraging and finding strengths in your client, in the student, to make them to bring out so that they can flourish. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share there and circle back to the panel. 
Great. So let me start with uh, you, Erin. Um, in your assessment courses, how do students become better readers of, uh, let's say, assessment reports? Great question. So thank you for being here. I can't see all of your faces, but I appreciate you setting aside the time. Um, so I teach both assessment courses. And what I'll say is folks who are in educational therapy or hovering around educational therapy have had the experience of working with a student when the topic or the instruction or the lesson goes beautifully. And then the converse experience of when effort just doesn't really match progress. The natural question there is why? And assessment is often one sort of stepping stone to understanding why, what's working, what's not. Um, I think whether you are in education, in administration, a tutor, chances are you've had your hands on one of those 35, 37 page reports. And you're trying to sift through what does the number mean? What does the diagnosis mean? What are the recommendations? And the assessment courses through this certificate program really work to make you a more informed consumer. So the numbers pop and they make sense. While we're not doing the diagnoses, it's important that we understand what they mean and the interventions that go along with those very learning profiles. So the assessment so, excuse me, course is really designed to make you a better consumer. And then if you choose to delve into the world of assessment, you'll have the techniques and the know-how to do the assessment independently as part of your role at a school, as part of a private practice, et cetera. Yeah, I think that um, most of us go out there and we get reports. Uh, we need to know what's important in there and you know how to uh, structure our, our remediation based on what's in there, yeah. Um, how about you, Shelley? Uh, what do you think are the most in-demand uh, assistive technology skills today? And does our program uh, kind of teach that? So um, I, I, let's first start by, by uh, making sure everybody understands that assistive technology can help to um, you know, bypass or reduce the impact of a student's learning weaknesses, but it can also be used to leverage their strengths. And also very importantly, um, learning specialists and certainly educational therapists are, um, are using various learning strategies to intervene and in, uh, improve the student's performance. A lot of different technologies can help to support or enhance those very strategies, all right? So um, anyway, so the uh, so AT can be a really valuable addition to um, uh, you know to an educational therapist's um, uh, toolbox of interventions. Let's put it that way. And um, in terms of the sorts of skills that, like I teach in my class, um, assistive technology for learning differences is. Um, first, you got to have a, a top level, you know, 30,000 foot understanding of what's out there. What are the possibilities? What can be done to help students who have specific types of uh, learning obstacles? Um, um, you know, what sorts of tools and uh, associated strategies are out there to um, help them and then have the ability to match a student with the appropriate technology features and uh, products that have those features. Okay, there's actually a bit of a science to this. It's less art, more science. And so uh, like in my course, I delve into that process so that people that leave, you know, leave with an actual process they can go through. And just as importantly, they can then, um, they can then justify any decisions or any recommendations they're making uh, to the people they're working with. You know, when you're sitting in an IEP meeting or you're working with a family, you need to be able to say, yeah, this is my recommendation, but here's why this is my recommendation and I can support that objectively. And then of course, understand how to implement those tools because then, you know, once you've chosen a tool and assuming it's the right one, um, 
uh, understand how to, you know, how do you train different types of students to use, say, word prediction or speech recognition or any of a variety of other uh, tools that are out there. Um, if you do want to learn more about the sort of stuff that's um, in this class, I, I actually created a separate website specifically for this class, and it has a memorable uh, name to it. Uh, the name of the course, of course, is Assistive Technology for Learning Differences. So the website is at, the number four, ld.net. Okay. And so you can learn more about the sorts of things that I would teach, the sorts of skills that I would teach. Thank you. Yeah, I think most of the students who take your class come out uh, transformed almost. Like, wow, I didn't know all this stuff was out there. So great. Uh, so let me talk to like Jessica and Rachel. So Jessica, um, What's your current role and how do you help students who have learning differences? Thank you so much for your time. Um, and yes, so I am a business owner um, of a tutoring center located in Union City uh, for the past 13 years. I've had a few locations in the Bay Area, but currently it's just in Union City. And uh, prior to this, I was actually working um, in HR. I was doing recruiting and compensation for about 10 years. Um, currently at the center, we have over about 100 students, and um, our methodology is pretty simple. We assess the students, we identify their needs, and then we create a personalized program for them. Um, our tutor-student ratio is one-on-two, and uh, how do we support? So at the center, we use various tools and techniques to assist students based on their learning styles and differences. I would have to say maybe about 70% of our students are either behind in grade level, have some type of IEP, or have been diagnosed with some type of learning difference. We support the students by working closely with the teachers and school districts to help um, their students achieve IEP goals quicker. Um, that's definitely something I picked up from taking uh, this course here. And at the center, we you know, continue to look for creative ways to help. Um, for example, our sessions are one hour long, um, and if a student has difficulty focusing due to ADHD, we usually provide maybe the last 10 to 15 minutes for math facts, math drills, even tracing or coloring, depending on their grade level, which can sometimes help with their focus and kind of put them in a meditative state. So we try to do different things, whatever sticks. <laughs> yeah, I think that... Uh... You were talking to me about how you help students achieve their IP goals by the end of the academic year versus just being pushed on to the next year, you know, so that's yeah. important. Yeah. How about you, Rachel? What's your current role? And, you know, tell us a little bit about um, how you support students. Thanks for joining us. Um, I am currently working as a education support specialist and coach. Um, I actually um, kind of created that title because I couldn't think of any other title that really encompassed what I do day in and day out. Um, because of my experience in education, working with kiddos from kinder all the way up to high school and now college age and, and young adults and even some older adults, I have this very unique perspective and I take a very holistic approach to working with everybody that I work with. Um, so most of my clients have uh, some type of neurodiversity, it could be anxiety, it could be ADHD, it could be autism, it could be a combination of other um, issues. I actually even do some literacy um, work with some, some young, younger kiddos, but the majority of my clients are 12 and up in age. And um, I do a lot of collaborating with teachers and parents on um, creating a, a plan that works best for them and individualizing the approach to what that particular client needs. So no two kiddos has, have the exact same program and the exact same approach. And I really, really enjoy it. It's one-on-one, -on -one. it's uh, 50 minutes a week with each person and it, I see results because the kiddos are really just making progress every day, doing new things. So it's, it's amazing. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's the best part of this work is that you just see them getting doing better and better. Yeah. So circling back to you, Erin, um, 
how do you see like the, your field uh, particularly and ed therapy in general how do you see it growing and you see our our program kind of fitting in with that in my 20ish years of doing this I've never had as many conversations with parents that were as informed as they are now. So here, I'm in the Silicon Valley. That's where I practice. That's where my clients are. Um, parents are highly educated in their own avenue of expertise, and they're highly educated around learning. They know about dyslexia. They know about dysgraphia. They know the criteria. They're very informed. Um, and we need to meet that demand, right? Parents want a more individualized, science-based, evidence-based approach so their child can make traction, can feel better, can blossom in their skills. So that's one way I think the field is growing because parents are asking for it, they're calling it for it, they're demanding it, rightfully so. Um, I think another reason the field is growing, and maybe this is okay to say or not, but is for economic reasons. Mm -hmm. So those of you who are in the field of education are in it for some level of heart right? You want to see people grow and to improve and life is expensive. And so having a private practice in addition to teaching or in lieu of teaching, wherever you're at, um, it's doing good work and it can have some financial benefits as well. So it meets both needs, right? That drive to support, that drive to help um, and an additional income, supplemental income. Something else I think um, I'll say really quickly and then I'll, I'll move along to the next person so I don't take up too much time. The science of reading is growing. It's a bit of a hot topic, but it is growing, particularly here in California, we're behind the times, but nationally. And teachers who haven't been exposed to the science behind reading, the system, the code, are often blown away when they see it, and that begets more questions. So I think the science of reading really delving in using a very systematic approach to teaching reading, writing, and spelling um, puts more demand on us here in this field of educational therapy, really informed teaching. Yes, and researched and uh, completely individualized. Uh, you have a set of tools and you pull out the ones that are relevant. Uh, how about you, Shelley? Uh, what do you think? Why is the field growing? And how do you think that the assistive technology competency, the need for that, is that growing? Well, it's kind of an understatement. I mean, uh, obviously, I, I don't need to go into detail, is that how education has moved more toward um, uh, digital instruction, um, uh, electronic distribution of materials, how, how it has moved more in that direction over the last, um, well, you know, 10 to 20 years, I'll say, very, very definitely. Um, you know, the, the, the materials are distributed, is, you know, whether it's in pretty much anything in Google, any of the Google apps, um, uh, PDFs, there's uh, web-based learning sites, instruction in class is done digitally. Um, schools have moved toward one-to-one uh, -one devices for students, be it, you know, like iPads for younger students, Chromebooks for older students, or bring your own device. There's, there's so many uh, uh, schools now, especially private schools, that'll say, hey, here's the minimum requirements on a Mac or a Windows PC, and this is what you're going to use in school. So it's, it's not just that it's moving in that direction, it's kind of like expected that people are going to take advantage of, you know, these uh, technology tools. And then of course, because of what we all had to go through with uh, COVID, um, interesting little side note, the first time I taught this class, which was in 2020, was the week the country shut down due to COVID. That was a really interesting experience. <laughs> Um, anyway, so with everything moving that way, that's actually a huge advantage for kids who are diverse learners, because it's much easier to make digital education more accessible to a wider range of different types of learning. Okay, I mean, you're, many of you are familiar with like Universal Design for Learning. Universal Design for Learning, UDL, isn't it doesn't inherently use technology, but boy, it is so much easier to 
um, uh, to teach using the principles of UDL when you're using technology because of the ability to to convert and adapt and and um, you know the materials and the instruction and such like that and as a result of all this um, if individual families at schools are going to educational therapists to um, you know looking for interventions they're going to be not just wanting to look at technology-based interventions, they're going to expect it because like, how can you survive in this, in this uh, current environment unless you're addressing that? So it, it's kind of also the need for competency in AT among um, teachers, learning specialists, and certainly education, uh, educational therapists has very definitely grown over the last several years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that it's just, it should, you can't do without it now. We've mm -hmm. all learned how to use it, even though we may have just uh, screamed a little bit. But um, um, how about Rachel, how about Jessica? Do you think that the program helped you uh, with uh, your career and uh, the capacity to have a supplemental income or did it increase your your income? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, you know, I feel very fortunate with the opportunities at the center itself already, but I do feel like after completing the program, um, I've seen a number of increase of students with IEPs enrolled at the center. And I think a lot of that has to do with just the confidence and knowledge that I've learned from this program that I'm able to pass down, so for sure. Wow. And financially, too, it was it's a good benefit as well. <laughs> Thank you. How about you, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, I when I tell parents that I'm finishing my program in educational therapy, it kind of gives them this, oh, because, like, you know, it's a new buzz term right now in, in terms of getting support for, for kiddos who need it is, in fact, that's kind of how I heard about this program in the first place was from my parents. So it was, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it's definitely made a huge difference in terms of me marketing my services to, to people. Fabulous. Wow, that was quite uh, informative. Thank you all to all parents, uh, to all panelists. Um, we can open it up to questions, Gary. Yeah, great. Thank you all so much. Um, I know Susan had a question in the Q&A asking, um, where is the market for ed therapy? I know we talked about, about that a little bit. Do you want to, are there any specifics um, anyone wants to share? Where is the market? Was that the question? Yes. Where is the market? Uh, well, California for sure. Uh, and New York and Eastern States, Illinois. There's some in Texas, but uh, primarily it's a California-based uh, profession. People are now working uh, remotely from the East Coast and it really doesn't matter anymore. But uh, with the younger kiddos, sometimes you need to see them in person. So, you know, local. Uh, but other than that, it's it's growing rapidly. Anyone else want to add to that? I'll, I'll add just really quickly with respect to um, different locations. The sort of themes, the goals of the program are applicable even if you don't fall under the title of an educational therapist. So even if you get this instruction and ETs aren't as known in your particular state, the instruction, the methodology, the approach is valuable even if you're called, you know, under a different title somewhere else, right? The intent is the same. Yes, uh, very, that's a really good point because sometimes uh, we have students who come from independent schools and they are the equivalent of a resource officer or the learning specialist for the on site. And uh, all of the courses here help them to manage that role. Uh, good point, yeah. Great. Um, we have another question. I'm a full-time first grade teacher. How does it work with completing the final capstone part of the program and working full-time? Is that manageable? It is manageable. Here's Rachel. She's nodding because that's exactly <laughs> her life. Rachel, do you want to take it over? <laughs> sure. That is actually exactly what I mean. I'm not um, in the classroom, but um, I have a full caseload of, of clients and um, it is flexible enough that you, they, you know, it can make it work. So I um, have two clients who I'm, I'm doing my practicum and, and you know, program um, 
capstone project with. Um, so I'm not having to go out and go and get go, you know, do an internship in somebody in a, a brand new business or a brand new location. I can do it through um, through where I'm already at. And so it's definitely very workable. And I'll also add that the classes are usually in the evenings. Uh, so it doesn't affect your work schedule. I've had I have plenty of classmates um, throughout the program in my cohort of students who were working full time in the classroom and then doing the classes in the evening. So it's it's definitely um, very doable. Um, Catherine asks, is there a market for educational therapy for those who have learning challenges post concussion? Yeah, Erin, do you want to ask? I guess one of my clarification questions, maybe you picked up on this better than I did, Dr. Roy, like if that was the clientele you wanted, is that how we're interpreting the question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would say so, because there's strategies to support reading comprehension, memory, many of the secondary challenges that come post-concussion. Um, there are strategies and tools under our umbrella that can be used to support those learning differences, right? I don't think we can make them disappear, but we can compensate accordingly. A follow-up, um, I'm a credentialed special education teacher with 19 years of experience, but would a master's degree be considered needed for a private practice? No. Simply no. Uh, I think that the Association of Educational Therapists, if you want to get board certified, uh, they want you to get a master's, but if you already have one, um, you won't need it. Thanks, Catherine. All right. Any final thoughts from Dr. Roy or any of our panelists? I'm happy that um, many of you are here, made the time. And uh, please, if you are planning on joining the uh, the certificate program, I suggest you start taking a couple of classes and then uh, declare candidacy. There are several that will add to your toolkit, no matter how much training you've had, it will bring you up to speed and cutting edge. Okay. Thank you to the panel. I am just uh, so grateful to all of you. Yes, thank you. I do have one final slide for our presentation today. Let me get it up. For, um, we just have a couple of upcoming courses that we think will help build out um, today's conversation. You can see they're starting later on this spring and into the summer. Um, we do have a career fair coming up uh, next month, and then there's a link to our um, events calendar. We hope to have more events like this in the future. Um, but we do want to thank all of you for being here today and sharing your time with us. Huge, huge thank you to Tramela, Aaron, Shelley, Rachel, and Jessica for sharing your insights and experience. Um, you may have seen we're recording today's session, so do keep an eye out in the coming week or so for a follow-up message, which will include a link to the recording as well as a link to these courses, um, as well as our program. Um, if you think of any questions later, you can always email us at extension at ucsc.edu. Um, someone will follow up with you shortly. Um, and again, we just want to thank you, and we hope to see you around campus again soon. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care.